And so when you think about the communications infrastructure space, think about also the future of connected anything. IoT is really the internet of things, and that means connected devices everywhere you go. It's, it's your watch, it's your car, it's your refrigerator, it's, it's not just a computer, it's not just your phone, it's connected everything. You can now connect to your doorbell, um, and that is only growing faster and, 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 and more so because it's creating efficiencies. Layer that on with artificial intelligence, which uses huge amounts of data for processing all of that information. There's no, there's no slowing down of what that communications infrastructure will be able to enable and empower businesses of all kinds all throughout the world. Welcome to the Inside Forbes Council's podcast. Each episode shares transformative insights and advice from members of Forbes Councils, a group of invitation-only communities for successful executives and entrepreneurs. This is Inside Forbes Councils. Hey everyone, this is Stephen Ganoza. Welcome to Inside Forbes Councils. Today, we have my interview with Alyssa Miller, founder and CEO of iMiller Public Relations. We discuss B2B marketing and public relations in the communications infrastructure space because behind all of our favorite apps are a myriad of companies that are not household names, companies that provide storage and bandwidth and connectivity. And while these companies are not household names, they are critical for the success of consumer platforms. Uh, We had an enlightening discussion on the marketing efforts that happen for those behind the scenes companies. Okay, Alyssa, thank you so much for joining us today. To kick us off, tell us a little bit about your company. Tell us about iMiller Public Relations and the work that you do. Uh, We are a PR and marketing company that services the communications infrastructure space. And what that means is all of the communications that are enabling us to talk virtually, to speak on the phone, to access the internet, to stream all that content, to do virtual meetings is all powered by that communications infrastructure. And we provide marketing and public relations services that help companies find their voice, amplify that voice, and be able to differentiate themselves in the market to be able to educate people about why these types of communication services are so important for their businesses and everyday lives. So can you tell me a little bit about who your clients are? Sure. Our clients here at iMiller Public Relations range the gamut, and you may not have heard of them, but you certainly know what they're about. Uh, One of our clients, DKIX, is the largest carrier and data center neutral internet exchange in the world. And they provide internet connectivity throughout the entire world, uh, Asia, Europe, and the North America. And they provide that core backbone connectivity for internet streaming, cloud access, uh, for any kind of ISP services and network providers including enterprise companies buy those services. We also work with a company in the Midwest called Bluebird Networks. And Bluebird Networks owns and operates network infrastructure for both businesses and wholesale purposes throughout the Midwest. And they uh, also provide a underground data center, which is in an old limestone mine, which is really rather very cool. We work with companies like Stack Infrastructure, Stack Infrastructure is a wholesale data center operator. They provide services to many of the hyperscale operators, uh, hyperscales, who are they? Think of the major social media platforms that we know of today. Those types of companies are considered hyperscale because they have large, huge, dense compute equipment that needs to be stored in data warehouses that provide the air conditioning and that power and capability to keep that operating at the most efficient use possible. So that's a stack infrastructure. Uh, Data Grid is another data center company, and they operate out of one of the most iconic buildings in New York City for telecommunications, 60 Hudson Street. 60 Hudson Street's history is really rather unique. It's formerly the Western Union building, 
And it's not too far away from AT&T's building at 32 Avenue of the Americas, which today also operates as a data center. They used to be called carrier hotels because that's where the international carrier uh, community would get their transport and connectivity from. And uh, there's a secret that those buildings are connected actually with these major tunnels below, deep below the ground. And it's how the telegraph workers used to exchange telegraphs between the Western Union and the AT&T building on roller skates. It's really quite amazing. <laughs> no way. So they would actually go down to the basement and rollerblade over to the next building? With that little piece <laughs> of paper in their hand. And that's how they exchanged the telegraphs back in the day because it was all, you know, uh, tapped in. Yeah. So the clients you described, they're all B2B businesses. Most of our clients are B2B businesses. Um, and, you know, it's rather broad, right? When you think about B2B, it's not just, you know, other carriers or other internet providers, but enterprise businesses today with all of the cloud connectivity and the remote working and all of the video streaming that they do, uh, many of them uh, are, are forced to operate like traditional carriers used to operate back in the day. They have to own and operate their own network. So it's really big bandwidth solutions that we're talking about. And certainly with the pandemic, those businesses are exploding. I think what's interesting is that you run a public relations firm, uh, but your clients are all B2B clients. They're not household names. Uh, they're not names that directly interact with the public. So what role does public relations play? That's a great question. So how do we help companies in the B2B space with public relations? You have to think about it this way. And here's a great analogy I'll use. Um, and I'll use the analogy uh, based off of what we learned during the COVID pandemic, toilet paper. So at the beginning of the pandemic, toilet paper became such a hot commodity. Remember, everybody was talking about how they couldn't get toilet paper. But it wasn't because toilet paper wasn't available. As a matter of fact, toilet paper for residential use is very different than toilet paper for commercial use. Commercial use toilet paper is thinner. It's, you know, more abrasive. It's not as comfortable, but it's also what's prevalent in restaurants and airports and all of these locations that people weren't going to. So people were at home and they were buying up all the residential toilet paper, which was nice, soft and comfortable and easy to use. But the other problem is that the commercial toilet paper was designed for certain types of dispensers. They had, they were large rolls. Um, maybe there were certain, you know, folds in them. They didn't fit those small rolls that we have at our homes. So it wasn't that toilet paper wasn't available. It was that the toilet paper that residential users was accustomed to was available. And those wholesale providers who were selling big lots of toilet paper for commercial use, they had a challenge because they couldn't redistribute and remanufacture how they provided that toilet paper to suit our personal needs. So it's similar in any kind of business, right? The, the communications business is much the same. So someone who is providing a subsea pipe, a network provider like Seaborn, who has undersea cable systems, they have really big pipes and the technology and the equipment that they provide to be able to interconnect their network to enable other networks and carriers to use their network is really large bandwidth solutions. And so companies that have large bandwidth solutions are going to buy large bandwidth needs. If you're just a, a home user, a residential user, or a small business, you may not have the need for those big bandwidth solutions. And the type of equipment that goes on the end of them to be able to transfer that has to be able to modify accordingly for the type of user that needs to interconnect with that. Well, it's the same thing in, in, in our communication space, as I mentioned, and there are many, many companies that are providing big pipe solutions. You hear many of the mainstream companies out there that you know of today, Zoom, uh, GoToWebinar and GoToMeeting, uh, you have Google and Facebook, and all of those companies, they buy big bandwidth solutions, but so do a lot of the companies I mentioned earlier some of the clients that we have because they're all providing different types of connectivity 
connectivity solutions to different parts of the world for different purposes, and they enable different types of companies to do that. And how the internet is designed, it's a web, it's an interweb of all of these different types of networks that connect. And the hub of those inter interwebs take place at data center facilities like stack infrastructure or data grid. And those network providers interconnect through platforms like a DKIX. And those subsea providers then are able to exchange and easily hand off different aspects of connectivity to and from their networks to exchange that. And there are thousands of these companies out there because it takes a lot of network to be able to ensure the redundancy, the resiliency, so that you and I, as we are talking right now, there's a network out there somewhere and we can't be going down. We can't even see that blip. The infrastructure has to be so robust that we don't understand what's going on or need, and, and the appreciation for that on, on the other side, it has to be seamless to the end user. And so working with these companies to be able to express specifically what they do, how they can help through those interconnections and identifying who they are is really a specialty. That's why we focus on the communications infrastructure space because understanding the entire ecosystem of how all of those networks have to work with one another, how they have to connect, where they need to connect, how they have to get that data transferred from point A to point B to assure that performance delivery and that end user experience can't go down is really important for public relations to do what it does best. We identify the market, we create those messages, we make it relevant, important, and most importantly, what we do is tell these stories, right? Being able to connect with people so that they can relate to what these unknown companies do, but they're so important to the everyday lives that we all have today. So your clients are not necessarily household names because we, the consumers, use products that then employ uh, your clients to deliver parts of their solution. Absolutely. The, our clients are the powerhouses that provide the big bandwidth, broad user-based solutions that enable all communications to happen. So what does a PR campaign look like for one of your clients, say, if they're looking to sell their services to someone like Zoom? So structuring a campaign in the B2B space uh, for the communications infrastructure sector is a lot like structuring any kind of campaign. They have to be fully integrated. Um, at the end of the day, right, companies have solutions that they need to buy, they need to enable, but it's the individuals that are buying them. And as I said, there are thousands of these companies all over the world, and there are emerging companies all the time. Think about all of the application providers out there that are providing cloud connectivity solutions that are connecting IoT devices. They all need really high speed, reliable internet services. And the way that they're gonna do that is by buying it through a wholesale direct underlying channel so that they can do with that bandwidth what they wanna do. So we create a communications campaign that is all encompassing. It tells the stories about what they're doing through press releases, announcing new products, services, capabilities. That's important because companies need solutions and if they can't find you, then they're never gonna be able to get that from your company. And then we have to also create case studies or use case scenarios that illustrate how these products and solutions are being used. We have to showcase that. We have to educate the importance of these. A lot of these companies are also creating new types of solutions or new business models that help make things easier as technology is getting faster and we're becoming more reliant on it. We need to get more people connected everywhere. So we have to create communications that educate the marketplace. And we do that through white papers, the research reports, article placements, and blogs. And just like in any sector, there are periodicals, there are various different publications online, and as well as print that focus on this. And in any major newspaper that you read, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, they all have technology beat reporters. 
those technology beat reporters are staying abreast of what's happening, why it's happening. And underlining tones actually take shape in this space because there's regulation that is applied to all of this. So you have government issues that, that tend to overlay on this. You have privacy laws. Not only that, but you also have inter-country, interstate regulations and inter-country laws that prohibit sometimes you being able from traversing either underwater or on land terrestrial networks that will connect you. So there are so many different issues that you need to stay abreast of to educate the market, to tell those stories and to stay ahead of some of the challenges that we might be seeing out there. Um, for instance, right now, 5G is a big promise. We all hear about it. Our phones are now starting to be able to be 5G. But what is that? Being able to connect with individuals on an individual basis like you and I to educate the importance of 5G is 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 is, is top notch why because those 5G networks are going to be deployed in communities there's going to be new towers there's going to be new small cell deployments out there and if communities aren't aware of what it is what it will do why it will be deployed the importance of it and to be assured of the safety of those different solutions being deployed in their communities, then it makes it really hard for this technology to be deployed out there. So it's a vast array of education. I mean, think about op-eds, being able to use op-eds. We have to talk to individuals and communities, uh, not just in businesses, and educate them about what's to come so that it makes everyone more comfortable when it does come. And how did you come to work in this particular niche? I mean, what's your background? What led you to PR and specifically PR for communications infrastructure? I love the industry and I actually come from the industry. Um, you know, my early career, um, you know, just like many people, you know, got my first job, did not know who I wanted to be when I grew up, um, what I wanted to do. And I, I fell into working with a consultant in the telecommunications space when deregulation um, opened up um, in, 19, in 1984, before I got into telecom, uh, the international carriers um, were um, a monopoly and that was deregulated to open up international carrier capabilities. And in 1996, the Deregulations Act expanded on that and really fostered competition to provide better services, more robust communications, and expand the reach of all of that infrastructure. And so I fell into the telecommunications space in 1996. And as I learned about it, and I kind of saw moving forward, wow, this internet thing is kind of cool. Um, people are gonna be able to connect with one another. Um, I fell in love with the idea of the stories of how the this world was going to be connected but yet so different and so far apart and i grew up in the industry and i uh, developed products and i managed products and business development and sold services um, and i was part of the industry for so long that i i just knew everybody in the space and what stories they had to tell and because i was so passionate about those stories i figured you know what let me go into pr and help all of these companies tell those stories because it's all interconnected, it all means something to everybody else. And I felt that that would be a great way for me to add value to what we do as an industry. Um, and that's how I got into providing PR services for communications infrastructure companies. I was always a writer. I was always a good storyteller. Uh, I had the technical aptitude of understanding some of the jargon and the acronyms that are being used. I was able to um, retain all of that information and not just retain it, but add to that, right? Once you learn something, it's easier to grow with than to have to learn it. And being, being part of this industry, Basically, since the World Wide Web, back when it was called the World Wide Web, was first introduced to mainstream users, um, I was able to grow and, 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 and learn and be able to grow and add value to that. Uh, just remember, 1993 is when AOL became more mainstream, and that's when instant messaging started. So it was only just a few years later that, you know, 
I became part of this particular community, the communications infrastructure space. And so there was a lot going on, a lot of changes. We had the dot-com bust and bubble uh, in 2000 to, to 2002, 2003. A lot of companies had a, a challenging time. There was a lot of capital invested. And a lot of that infrastructure still lives today. Um, has been expanded, has been upgraded, um, has been modified to suit the growing and demanding needs that we as consumers have. So stepping back a bit from communications infrastructure to PR in general, there's generally an idea within PR that you should diversify your client portfolio in case a particular industry falls out of favor. Uh, you're focused on communications infrastructure. How do you think about your client portfolio and, and diversifying your clients? So the industry, as I mentioned, is really broad, right? You have voice, voice operators, you have data operators, you have big bandwidth, content providers, the hyperscalers, all of this infrastructure is really important. And that's just on the wire line side. There's also the wireless side. I mentioned 5G. And that's a burgeoning market. Um, it's rather complex, right? So when we think about what's happening during the COVID pandemic, certainly our industry is growing because uh, a lot more internet capacity is required, a lot more streaming and data use and video. Um, but there's also a subset of the industry that's really challenged. Think of all of those enterprise buildings where they do not have the people going to work at the same rate that they had, all of the big network solutions that were implemented to enable those office spaces to, to be connected are now being underutilized. And so it's not a, a, such a rosy picture for communications infrastructure. And just like in any sector or any industry, it even though it sounds focused, communications infrastructure, it's very broad. Um, and it's also uh, one of the most important needs that we have today because it's the only way that's keeping us connected. So I made a bet and I made, and the bet was on this broad set of the industry that demand for data and the insatiable need to store that data, to access that data, to share that data was going to continue to grow. And a few years ago, I, I, I acquired an association called NEDAS, which at the time was called the Northeast DAS and Small Cell Association. And that was all about um, connecting that wireline infrastructure to enable mobile communications because we're all going mobile. And so when you think about the communications infrastructure space, think about also the future of connected anything. IoT is really the internet of things, and that means connected devices everywhere you go. It's, it's your watch, it's your car, it's your refrigerator, it's, it's not just a computer, it's not just your phone, it's connected everything. You can now connect to your doorbell, um, and that is only growing faster and, 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 and more so because it's creating efficiencies. Layer that on with artificial intelligence, which uses huge amounts of data for processing all of that information. There's no, there's no slowing down of what that communications infrastructure will be able to enable and empower businesses of all kinds all throughout the world. So communications infrastructure may seem narrow to those of us who are not in the space, but uh, it sounds like there's a lot of diversification within that umbrella. Exactly, yes. So another topic that often comes up when discussing PR uh, generally is crisis communication. Uh, if your clients are not directly public facing, is this an area of concern uh, for your clients? Crisis communications happens in our space all day, every day. Um, it's a really important element and every single one of our clients has to plan for a crisis. What is a crisis? A crisis in communications infrastructure is a blackout and your generators don't have power and all of that compute infrastructure cannot deliver the internet access and the data that everybody wants access to. I mean, that is a big crisis in and of itself. Um, fires happen. Um, 
You know what's interesting in our space is that there are so many builds going on. And when you think about builds, it's underground. They have to dig the streets. And when you dig the streets, what happens? You're going to hit other things. You're going to hit water mains. You're going to hit somebody else's network and take them offline. So all of those situations that as we're building things out, as we're managing, as we're operating, there are crises around every single corner. And we have to be prepared always to make sure that we know how to be able to reach clients provide those assurances, um, give them regular updates, because what people want at the end of the day is to be able to, to, to use their phones to access the internet. They don't care what happens in between. And when a disruption happens, it's disruptive. it disrupts everything in their lives. So crisis communications is really very important for us. And now we're more dependent than ever on this infrastructure. Absolutely. Okay, Alyssa, I certainly learned a lot. Um, how can people find out more about either you or iMiller Public Relations? Listen, uh, we're iMiller Public Relations, iMillerPR.com, we're easy to find. Um, listen, we love to talk about what we do. Uh, we don't just talk about our clients, though they're really important to our business and the industry. Um, the nice thing about what we do is we, we work with as many different companies in the communications infrastructure space as we possibly can um, because we love these stories. And uh, we work with associations, with event organizers. Um, we work with all of the different uh, periodicals and publications that help tell these stories. And if anyone's ever curious about it, I'm always happy to talk about it. I hope you hear my passion because uh, I love what we do. I love what we do for this industry and I love this industry. So please do reach out to us. Alyssa, thank you so much for your time today. All right. Well, you're very welcome, Stephen. Thank you for having me. For more about public relations. Overnight successes in public relations are the biggest myth. And one of the biggest things is people do not realize that there's a lot of planning and work that goes into a campaign before it actually goes out. One of the biggest things is really crafting and, and creating that story so that it's pitchable in a way that a media person will understand it, that they'll get it, that they will actually pluck that pitch out of the thousands of pitches that they get on a, on a weekly basis. Check out episode 67, where Nicole Dunn of Dunn Pellier Media dispels the myth of the overnight success. Well, that's all we have for today. As always, thank you for listening. Please be sure to subscribe and we'll see you on the next episode. This has been Inside Forbes Councils. Please be sure to subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you're a member of the Forbes Councils and would like to participate in our podcast series, please email your member concierge. If you're interested in joining a Forbes Council, learn more at ForbesCouncils.com.